Oh boy. Hello again, my beautiful viewers, the Green Scorpion here, and welcome back to Patreon Month. The month where I acknowledge my generous patrons so that they can rip my heart out. We got an emotional one this week, as recommended by Minion of the East. A2, Minion. You know, trusting someone can be difficult. You have to open yourself up, make yourself vulnerable, but not everyone is worthy of that trust. Plot twists come in many shapes and sizes, but I'm a character guy. And there's something deeply personal about being stabbed in the back. It hurts. But it brings about an emotional catharsis, at least in fiction where they can't really kill you. For today, I've tried to pick 10 objectively great examples of a well-executed reveal, but I'd be lying if I said my personal experiences weren't a factor. Still, we want betrayals that are not just surprising, but narratively satisfying. It has to make sense for the character to betray you, and it should be used to benefit the story or gameplay in some way. It doesn't have to be a huge shocker, but the best deceits often are. For instance, most of the characters I'm showing in this intro aren't really great examples, because I'm trying not to stuff the beginning full of spoilers. After this point though, I'm going into full spoiler territory. We kept things secret for top 10 mysteries, but not this time. I'll be putting warnings and time codes on the screen before each reveal, so feel free to skip ahead if there's a certain game you're still planning on playing fresh. With that out of the way, watch your backs and trust no one. Because this, my friends, are the top 10 video game betrayals. Like I said, not all great betrayals have to be surprising per se. Number 10 is actually one of the most well-known twists in gaming. So if you somehow still don't know about Portal and Portal 2, you can proceed to the next testing chamber now. Then again, the betrayal itself isn't what surprised us about the original Portal. When this odd puzzle game first came out as part of the Orange Box, people were hyped about the sequel to a celebrated first-person shooter and the hilarious multiplayer slugfest Valve was hyping up with the Meet the videos. In comparison, Portal seemed like just a neat little demo with a clever space-bending gimmick. We're not expecting anything too deep, the game doesn't even have characters. It's just you and this voiceover giving you instructions. You're doing these tasks to test out a new weapon, but you might have assumed that you're being observed by a room full of scientists or something. It slowly dawns on you that there's no one behind the glass. That voice talking to you isn't artificial intelligence, and it's done away with all of the humans in Aperture Labs. Killer robots have been done to death. When a computer gets so sophisticated, it starts to threaten humanity. But the writing behind GLaDOS is what makes it work. Shifting from sterile instructions, The Enrichment Center promises to always provide a safe testing environment. To offbeat black humor, Did you know you can donate one or all of your vital organs to the Aperture Science Self-Esteem Fund for Girls? It's true. To legitimately unnerving threats, The Enrichment Center is required to remind you that you will be baked and then there will be cake. Not complex, but expertly executed for such a humble game. Things get a little more interesting in Portal 2 with the new lore and characters, mainly your helpful friend Wheatley. After GLaDOS's treachery in the last game, you and Wheatley are walking on eggshells trying to escape. It's nice to finally have a friendly face around, even if he is ostensibly useless. He tells you that he's going to hack into things or figure out a path ahead, but it's really you doing all of the work, he's just the moral support. He finally plays his part when you give GLaDOS' control of the lab over to him. He's booting up the elevator, and you're finally about to escape, and... He reconsiders. Wheatley! What are you doing? Wheatley, no! Wheatley, no! Don't misunderstand, Wheatley has not been planning this all along. He's not smart enough to do so. But as soon as he's hooked up to the central control unit, the power goes right to his head, and he becomes obsessed with running you through more tests. He's not doing it to be mean to you, he's just shut himself off to your feelings. He was invented to be a personality core of ineptitude. He's scientifically designed to fail at everything, and now he has the one thing he's wanted since the beginning of the game, some freaking recognition. Not only is it a much more surprising twist, it makes GLaDOS' turn in the first game retroactively more interesting. Maybe she wasn't so bad, the same way Wheatley wasn't. Maybe this is just what power does to people. After being an immoral monster in the first game, Portal 2 humanizes her, rather literally with the revelation of Carolyn, while your plucky sidekick is corrupted and would rather let the entire facility explode than admit that he can't handle things. 
It's very heartbreaking, but oddly enough, I don't feel anger when Wheatley traps me, or when GLaDOS regains control and immediately disregards all the camaraderie you've gained with her. All I feel is pity. I tried to pick one, but I can't really put one of these on the countdown without the other. GLaDOS for laying the foundation and providing this great playable sequence with the furnace, and Wheatley for showing how any friendship can crumble with just a few lines of code. Man, all I wanted was some cake. You know who I don't pity? A certain someone from Xenoblade Chronicles. Oh yeah, you know the one. Here you are about 60 hours into this RPG, and you're finally confronting the big bad Agil, ruler of Mekonis, who has been sending waves of killer robots to invade your world. You undergo a brutal final battle, Shulk goes in for the final blow, but then realizes that violence is not the answer. A truce can be made so that Bionis and Mekonis can coexist in peace, and Egil graciously agrees. You got the good ending for about 10 seconds, and then BAM! Our main character shot in the back by this creep, Dixon, Shulk's adoptive father. Turns out we got quite a bit of game left to go. It's shocking enough for the story to ramp up again after what's seemingly the end of the line, or for our main character to suddenly be offed, but by Pappy Dixon? Dixon's one of the first characters we met in this game. He was a war hero who fought alongside Dunban and Mumkar, but we already knew Mumkar was a total pettigrew. But I didn't know both of Dunban's friends would turn out to be backstabbers. Dixon was the one who first found an orphan Shulk, the lone survivor of a mountain expedition, and brought him home and raised him as his own. But that was all a front, wasn't it? Turns out Dixon's from an ancient race of shape-shifting giants, and is one of the top disciples of a god called Zanza. And when the moment is right, after Shulk and the gang have weakened Zanza's greatest threat, Dixon releases Zanza by killing Shulk. And he's a real Dixon about it! Okay man, I get it. Your sole purpose is to serve your god. You don't really care about these puny mortals. But after years of living amongst the homes, did you not grow even the slightest bit of compassion for them? Is it really that easy for you to murder your adopted son in cold blood? Yeah, he's freaking proud of it. Immediately mocking the party for being friends with a corpse. Talk about insult to injury, Dixon. You really deserve to be on the worst father's list, but I guess I was just repressing the memory. I felt bad for GLaDOS and Wheatley, but this guy? Yeah, you know what, Dixon? F*** you! Seriously though, we're only on number 9? Mad! Alright, let's keep this moving. Back to Dragon Age Inquisition. <sighs> I'm getting too angry too fast. Makes me wish I saved the Berserker's countdown so I could let off some steam. Oh hey, there's one. Good to see you, the Iron Bull. Change of plans. Nothing personal. Boss. Oh, Bull, not you too. If there is any solace to this, it's that this is one of the few conditional betrayals on the list. It doesn't have to be this way. This is a Bioware game after all. They've always prided themselves on player choice, and what good is choice without consequences? It's usually not possible to recruit everyone in a playthrough. In Baldur's Gate, you kinda have to pick from the get-go if you were playing good or evil. If you mixed and matched, you'd have issues. Good party members often got into fights with the evil ones, and characters would leave you or even attack you if you did something outside of their moral boundaries. Dragon Age is a lot more intricate. The Iron Bull isn't too hard to get along with. Any conversation you have with him is full of opportunities to gain his approval. But deep down, he's always had conflicted loyalties between his race, the Kyun, and his family of mercenaries, the Chargers. Not to mention, you and the Inquisition. During a quest called Demands of the Kyun, all three parties are working together on a military operation against the Venatori. You're making good headway at first, but in time a huge force of Venatori are moving in towards the Chargers and you're forced to make a difficult choice. You can either abort the mission and sacrifice the Kanari Dreadnought, which shatters any chance of aligning with the Kyun, or you can sacrifice the Chargers, guaranteeing the mission's success at the expense of their lives. The interesting thing is, either way, the Iron Bull will gain substantial approval for you. But he's crying on the inside. 
This choice becomes a lot more significant in the last DLC for the game, Trespasser, which eventually sees you going toe-to-toe -to -toe against the Kyun. The Iron Bull tags along as usual, but then the Kunari Priestess tells the Iron Bull to attack you. Little did we know that his decision has been made a long time ago. If you save the Chargers, the Iron Bull will stand by you, having learned that friendship is more important than his zealous ancestors. But if the Chargers died, even after all the time he spent in the Inquisition, even if you maxed out his approval, even if you chose him as your romantic partner, he chooses the Kyun. For all of the stat trees and branching decisions in this game, the Bull's loyalty was based on one moment. When you let his friends die, he decided that there is no place for friendship on the battlefield, and fell back on the Kyun. I think I've expressed enough how much I love this big lug. But he just drove a plus one battle axe into my heart with this action. The sad thing is, I can't even be mad at you, Bull. I made that decision. It's my fault. I'm sorry. Well, if I wanted something to cheer me back up, I've come to the wrong place. Professor Layton is surprisingly good at pulling my heartstrings. At least it's not Unwound Future, no 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 no. We're heading to the prequel trilogy again, with the adventures of Layton, Luke, and of course, Emmy. You know, Emmy? What, don't you recognize her? Well, that's because she wasn't even mentioned in the first three games, which supposedly takes place after this. I'm getting a bit of an Ahsoka Tano vibe here. Well, it turns out, Emmy has been traveling with Leighton for slightly longer than Luke has. She's his personal assistant assigned to him by Dean Delmona at Gresson Heller University. Leighton briefly remarks that he and the Dean never discussed an assistant, but there's not much reason to suspect anything's amiss. Leighton was already headed to investigate the mysterious Spectre, so they probably just missed each other. And besides, Emmy is wonderful! She's intelligent, sweet, and kind of a badass. Seriously, don't mess with her! She's just as much of a bodyguard as she is an assistant. And she has a lot of sincere admiration for the professor, as it's revealed that he saved her from a false arrest when she was 16. She really looks up to Leighton, so it's all the more surprising when Azrin Legacy comes around. After three full games and a movie, all kinds of crap starts hitting the fan. There's a girl named Aurora who's the lost link to an ancient civilization, and unlocking its legacy could have disastrous consequences to the world, Raiders of the Lost Ark style. This background villain named Leon Bronov has been harassing Leighton to get to Aurora. Then Leighton's friend Sycamore turns out to be the nefarious Gene Descalay in disguise. Leighton chases him to Froenberg, finds this important keystone, Descalay takes it. Bronov shows up and claims that he has Descalay's parents and will kill them if Descalay doesn't hand over the stone. Leighton stops them by stealing the stone himself. It has been a crazy day! But at least Leighton and the gang are in control again. But Bronev reveals his ace in the hole, his niece, Emmy, who just pulled a knife on Luke! Good God, Emmy! Was this foreshadowed at all in the other games? I honestly can't remember because I'm so shocked to see Emmy holding an actual knife to a child's throat. So this is what forces Leighton to hand over the stone and let Bronev and Emmy get away, moving on ahead to get the treasure. Well, shoot! Honestly, this one's a little cheap. It seems to me like something they wrote in for the game, not something they planned to do throughout the whole trilogy, but I was certainly surprised. And yeah, it fits. Emmy was an orphan raised by Bronev when she had nowhere else to go. She's a member of Targent, which is how she learned to be an awesome martial artist. And she hadn't intended to betray Leighton until this very moment. Her uncle was actually a really nice guy, but she noticed that he was becoming obsessed with the Azrin legacy. Emmy was hoping that Leighton could bring Bronev back to his senses, but when the moment comes, she chooses family over friends. In the end, Leighton and Emmy are able to reconcile, but it'd be a little awkward to keep working for someone after that, so Emmy resigns as Leighton's assistant and bids farewell. This betrayal would be higher on the list if it felt more set up, but I have to admit, it is a fantastic reveal. You're the smartest guy around, Herschel, but you sure didn't figure that one out. Now just wait until you hear Descalay's backstory. How about we get a win for once? 
Let's look at Super Paper Mario. You know, the game where the entire multiverse is being swallowed by a black void? Where you actually go to the Super Mario equivalent of hell? Oh yeah, this is gonna be good. See, I never said that this list was all characters who betray you. Case in point, Dementio. One of the greatest evil masterminds ever to grace our screens. What did I say about trusting clowns? The entire game, you're working to stop the plans of Count Bleck. He's following a prophecy written in a dark tome, using the Chaos Heart that will rip apart all reality. Bleck's doing all of this because he lost the love of his life, wants to escape his endless grief, and wants to prevent any living thing from ever feeling the ache of love and loss. A mite overdramatic, but he has the chops to back up his big emo plan. Following him are a burly space Scotsman named O-Chunks, a creepy shapeshifter named Mimi, a devoted secretary named Nastasia, and of course, Dementio, who is hinted in some text to be descended from the ancient magicians who created the pixels and wrote the prophetic books. There are actually two prophecies, the Dark Prognosticus and the Light Prognosticus, and Dementio has done his research and seems to know how both prophecies go. Maybe that's why his face is half dark and half bright. But don't dismiss him as the foolish underling. It's clear in every scene that he's the smartest guy in the room, and he's been manipulating events to reach his own ends. Dementio helps Black bring about the end of worlds, but also knows the Light Prophecy and indirectly helps Mario to thwart it. The Light Prognosticus calls for four heroes of light, so Dementio uses his interdimensional teleportation powers to reunite Mario, Peach, Bowser, and eventually Luigi. How did you think Peach got out of Black's castle in one piece? And reading the green one is destined to activate the Chaos Heart, Dementio jury rigs fate by controlling Luigi with Nastasia's hypnosis. He knows that Count Black's love is still alive, but he chooses to hide that information until just before Black's final confrontation with Mario. That way, Black loses his conviction and is easier to defeat. He even factors in the usual power of love trope that Mario's friends use to make Black vulnerable. Most villains overlook that part! Then, after Black is defeated and Mario is tired out, Dementio springs into action, hits Luigi with one of those brain sprouts from Chapter 5, in turn activating the Chaos Heart, and merges with the Chaos Heart and Luigi to become this sick amalgamation. He attaches himself to Black's plan to destroy all creation, and jumped in at the last moment so he could rule all creation. And now the Heroes of Light are down to three, so they can't do crap! It would have all worked out for him had he not realized that Black's underlings loved Black enough to summon their own power of love. Even in defeat, Dementio just cackles and collapses into a black hole, satisfied that the worlds are still going to be erased. Ultimately, we're not even sure of his motivations, he's just an evil, evil clown. We've seen this true Architect of Your Destruction story dozens of times, as well as villains double-crossing villains. Kefka does largely the same thing in Final Fantasy VI, and I do love Kefka. But in this case, the betrayal itself is a bit less obvious and a bit more fun to follow. You can tell Dementio's planning something in the background, even the other underlings are suspicious of him, but you're never sure what. For a guy who can very easily kill you with a snap of his fingers, and we've seen him do it, it's a great source of tension knowing that he's holding back and setting up this ridiculous plan. I don't even feel like the plan is too complicated. He knows the future from two different books, after all. He's just altering things so that the prophecy happens his way. And unlike some villains I could mention, maybe from a game I recently let's played, Dementio's actions never threaten his overall plan. He's never trying too hard to kill Mario, who he needs for his plan to work. Well, okay, he does kill Mario and company that one time, but that's actually so that they can go to the afterlife and find that last pure heart, so he's still working within his own parameters. Honestly, Dementio, I know we have to stop you, but you kind of deserve to win. I'm really impressed with all of this. GG. Am I really about to talk about Call of Duty? I'm a little apprehensive. It's kind of like Warcraft for me. It's a hugely popular franchise that I've only played a little bit of, and while I'll research it as best I can, I know some uber fans are going to tear me apart. Well, Semper Fi, I'm going in anyway, because I have to talk about the Modern Warfare games. 
I may not know too much about the backgrounds of these characters, and realistic war stories kind of bore me to be honest, saving Private Ryan being a huge exception. All in all, it's just not for me. But Modern Warfare is great at constructing powerful, jaw-dropping moments. I was barely paying attention to the plot of Modern Warfare 1 when I was stricken by the shock and awe mission. Even without the context, that's extremely affecting, playing from the perspective of a man caught in a nuclear explosion. Call of Duty set a pretty big standard in the first game, and everybody was wondering how they were going to top it in a sequel. News got out pretty quick of Modern Warfare 2's opening mission, No Russian, which, yeah, is pretty jarring, but I can't help but feel that it's there just for the sake of being controversial. No, the real standout moment is at the end of the mission, Loose Ends. I'm just gonna let this one play out. We got it, sir! Good. That's one less loose end. Oh, that is good. Even without knowing who this guy is, the blocking of this scene is amazing. That's your commanding officer, the one you're supposed to trust above all others, and he just killed you in cold blood and hot petrol. And he's so freaking efficient about it, Ghost doesn't even know how to react before he's shot through the neck, he's just so stunned by what's happening. This is the real successor to Shock and Awe right here. Which makes sense, because shock and awe is the big reason why Lieutenant General Shepard just lit you up. He was the Supreme Commanding Officer of the United States Forces in the Middle East during the first game. When Russian terrorists set off that nuke, Shepard lost 30,000 Marines. And when the perpetrators weren't satisfactorily punished at the end of the war, Shepard lost his freaking mind. He devoted the rest of his life to reasserting the US as the greatest military power on Earth, and to a more selfish extent, proving himself to be a war hero. Remember the no Russian mission? Yeah, he set that up with the Russians, and he made sure that only an American body would be left behind, all to instigate a war between America and Russia. This gets Shepard a blank check from the government to go hunting after Makarov and be the guy to take that monster down. In the meantime, he uses his task force to clean up any information connecting him to the scandal, and has the task force killed in case they know too much. The worst part is, he kind of gets away with it. Not literally, Soap and Price eventually catch up to him and he's killed in spectacular fashion, but at the end of the game, he does in fact go down in history as a war hero. That bastard just took a knife to his eye and still got what he wanted. Really though, this entry is all about that one cutscene. Say what you will about the Call of Duty franchise being repetitive, when they do something right, they do it right. You know what's been fun about Patreon Month? Even though the lists aren't related, some of them share themes, so that a few franchises come up two or three times. It shouldn't be a surprise that there's a betrayal in Danganronpa, a game where everyone is assigned to kill each other. If things went the way Monokuma advertised, by the end of the game there'd only be one victor and a pile of their deceived foes. If anything, it's surprising how many murders aren't betrayals in this game. But for this list, one betrayal stuck out to me. Those of you familiar with the game are probably thinking of that one person, the big one, the mastermind. But I'm going for something a little more personal. First game, first case. After the killing game is explained to these kids, it takes a pretty long time for any actual murders to happen. Which I appreciate, no one immediately resorts to kill or be killed, they try to find another way out. During this time, the main character Makoto gets to know the rest of the gang, especially his old grade school crush, Sayaka. Despite her status as the ultimate pop sensation, she's pretty down to earth and effectively becomes Makoto's assistant while searching the building. When things seem scary, she uses Makoto's shoulder to cry on, which Makoto doesn't mind too much because she's super hot. One night, Sayaka gets a threatening note and is too afraid to stay in her own room, so she asks Makoto to switch rooms with her. I mean, sure, he'll be safe, he's a big, strong, 5 foot 3 man. Makoto agrees because he's a total beta, and now he gets to sleep in a girl's bed that smells like girl. But despite their switcheroo, we awake the next morning to find Sayaka murdered. Gruesomely murdered. This game comes out swinging by killing off your supposed sidekick and love interest. This is like if Maya died at the beginning of Ace Attorney, or Luke at the beginning of Professor Layton, or Lin at the beginning of Ghost- Okay, bad example. So who could do this? 
after weeks of bonding, who of these 15 students betrayed the class? As it turns out, Sayaka did. Sounds crazy, but listen, you'll figure out pretty easily that the murderer in this case was Leon, the baseball star. Sayaka wrote his name in blood, and he's the only one who could have disposed of the evidence. But at first, it's really hard to put together the story until you realize that Sayaka wanted to murder Leon. She had enough living in this school. She needs to get out and see what's happened to her friends. So she breaks down and plays the killing game. At least, she tries to. She switches rooms with Makoto, she invites Leon over to chat, and then she tries to kill him with a kitchen knife. If everything went according to plan, Leon would be dead, and since the murder was in Makoto's room, everyone would think Makoto killed him. She was trying to frame him! Seriously Makoto, you're a freaking moron! You should have known that she wasn't really into you, she's way out of your league! This hits hard, because from the first case, there's already a twist. The bad guy here is the one who got murdered for instigating the situation. Sure, Leon's at fault too. When Sayaka tried to kill him, he easily overpowered her and saw his opportunity to selfishly kill her and escape the school. But to be fair, Sayaka didn't know that she was betraying the whole class. It's not until the first murder that Monokuma explains the court cases, where everyone dies if they fail to catch the killer. But, she did try to betray Leon, and she tried to get Makoto hanged for it. Jeez. Fortunately, the crew solves the case, but Leon still gets executed by baseballs. Poor guy, he's practically the victim here. And the most chilling thing about this whole case is the moment just before she puts her plan into motion. This is after she sees Monokuma's incentive video of her old bandmates, and decides she needs to escape to find them at all costs. She has a heart-to-heart -heart with Makoto, thanks him for being there for her, and says that she knows he'll be the one to get her out of this place. Ooh, that is devious. She didn't mean that he'd find a way out. She meant that he'd take the fall for her when she leaves. That's cold-blooded, Sayaka. But I guess I understand. Everyone has a breaking point. Sayaka makes the perfect introduction of Danganronpa. The game where you can't trust anyone. Speaking of trusting no one, Metal Gear! A series of war and duplicity. Everyone has an agenda, there's always someone pulling the strings, and there's usually someone pulling that guy's strings. We're all interconnected puppets in a political web. Or to put it more simply, Everybody betrayed me. I fed up with this world. Just look at Metal Gear Solid. Out of everyone on your Codex support team, Campbell's withholding information, Merrill at one point gets brainwashed into killing you, Miller is actually liquid, Deep Throat is actually Gray Fox, Nastasha won't tell you about her past, Otacon built Metal Gear in the first place, and Mei Ling... Actually, you know what? You're doing great, Mei Ling. Never change. The one on trial here is Naomi Hunter. Maybe not the worst backstabber in the series, but to me, one of the most interesting. Naomi is a geneticist brought on board for the Shadow Moses operation to consult on Snake's health and manage a series of experimental nanobots that she's injected into Snake's body. As you may know from the Greater Metal Gear series, nanomachines, son, are practically magic, as they can be used to accelerate Snake's healing, distribute painkillers, and keep his blood from freezing in the harsh Alaskan environment. Naomi can even remotely activate them to give Snake extra shots of adrenaline. It's nuts! But as helpful as these are, working with Naomi isn't exactly pleasant. While Snake has good rapport with the rest of the team, Naomi can be aloof, judgmental, and downright mean to Snake. She treats Snake like some kind of sociopathic killer. What's your damage, Naomi? Well, it turns out that there's a lot we don't know about Miss Hunter. For starters, that might not even be her real name. She was just some Rhodesian orphan whose parents were killed in a civil war. Luckily, she was adopted and raised by a mercenary named Frank Yeager. Sound familiar? It should if you played the old 2D Metal Gear games. Frank became Naomi's adopted brother, and they were able to bring Naomi to America thanks to the sponsorship of Big Boss, who Frank then worked for under the codename Grey Fox. In Metal Gear 2, Big Boss and Frank were the bad guys, and Snake had a run-in with both of them allegedly killing them. Frank was saved only by new cybernetic implants that made him the metal ninja we know and love, but Naomi swore revenge on Snake. She stole the identity of the real Dr. Hunter, got herself on the Shadow Moses team, 
But how exactly does she betray Snake? Well, throughout the game, men Snake meet have this odd habit of suddenly having heart attacks. That's because of Naomi. When she injected Snake with the nanomachines before the mission, she also gave him her newly created Fox Die virus. Before the game even started, Naomi has effectively killed you. Let me get one thing straight here. Fox Die wasn't all Naomi's idea. The DNA targeting disease was ordered by the Secretary of State Jim Houseman so that it would kill all of the terrorist leaders Snake came across. So Snake wasn't really there to shut down Metal Gear, so much as to spread a disease to Liquid and the others and hide the secret altogether. Snake was unwillingly transformed into a biological weapon. Naomi may not have given the order, but she was certainly happy with betraying Snake in this way. And she even secretly made her own adjustment to Fox Die, a wildcard mechanic, so that it would eventually target and kill Snake himself only after a random amount of time. Naomi doesn't know how long it will take, a few days or 20 years, but she decides the greatest punishment will be for Snake to live in a limbo of uncertainty, never knowing when he can suddenly contract and die. Evil as that is, it gets more interesting. Because while leading Snake through Shadow Moses, Naomi starts to realize that Snake isn't the heartless jerk she made him out to be. He shows actual remorse for hurting his enemies, even though it's in self-defense and for the good of his country. Naomi comes to see Snake for the melancholy hero that he is, but it's a bit too late, she can't uninject him. My favorite aspect is what comes after. Not from Naomi, but from Snake. After learning of Naomi's deceit, Snake should hate her guts, but that's not how Snake operates. In fighting Metal Gear, Snake fights alongside Frank one last time to stop the machine, and Frank gives his life for the cause. His last words to Snake are a request, to tell Naomi the truth. Frank is the one who killed Naomi's parents all those years ago, and he adopted her to make up for it. Seeing his old frenemy dying, Snake eventually gets the chance to relay the message, but instead, he keeps Frank's secret. He tells Naomi that Frank always loved her and would be proud. He figures it's better for Naomi this way, rather than ruin her perception of the only person in the world that she ever trusted. Even after she ruined his life, Snake returns to Naomi not with malice, but with kindness and understanding. I won't go any further into it, this section is long enough, but there's a reward for this too. Naomi returns the kindness in Metal Gear Solid 4, and things would have turned out a whole lot different if she hadn't. The Metal Gear series is essentially a string of vengeance and triple crosses, but not for Snake. He accepts what he's done to hurt people, he accepts what Naomi did to retaliate, and he forgives her. Man, I love Snake. Three simple words. Would you kindly... I'm sure you're at least adjacently aware of Bioshock's once monumental plot twist. It reminds me a lot of a certain death from Final Fantasy VII. It was so astonishing that we all talked it to death, and now everybody knows about it to the point of it feeling unremarkable. But put yourself back in 2007. Yes, I mean 2007 this time. And this has to be one of the best executions of a twist in the history of the medium. Just watching the clip doesn't do it justice, it needs the several hours of context and ambience that the game builds up before it. But since you probably already know about it, I won't do that build up, I'll just get right into the meat of it. From the beginning of the game, Andrew Ryan is framed as the root of all evil, and yeah, he really is, but when you finally make it to his office, you're greeted not with a boss fight, but with this weird exchange. A man chooses, a slave obeys. Then he opens the door, you get your chance to kill him, but instead, control is taken away from you for the first time. It's kind of like Half-Life 2. Even during the cutscenes, you're always able to move your character or at least look around. But when Andrew Ryan stops you in your tracks, it's alarming. Stop, would you kindly? Would you kindly? Powerful phrase. Familiar phrase. Then he makes you run around the room, and finally, embed a golf club into his skull. OBEY! <laughs> 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 
What is going on here? Well, your betrayer isn't Andrew Ryan. You just murdered him. Against your will. The culprit, surprise, is your buddy Atlas. That smooth, friendly Dublin accent coming over the radio. It was all a lie. There is no Atlas. He's actually Frank Fontaine. And he's been controlling your every action through psychological conditioning. Activated by the simple phrase, Would you kindly? What's so great about this revelation is all the questions it raises about the game's core theme. Free will. Especially as it pertains to player choice. Bioshock is extremely linear. The whole time, you just go where the game tells you to. Where Atlas tells you to. Because as gamers, we're conditioned to follow instructions. That's how we progress the story. Even if blowing up Rapture in retrospect isn't a very good plan. But we never questioned Jack's backstory because we just figured it wasn't important for him to have one. Jack wants to escape Rapture, we figured that was all there was to it. With the phrase, would you kindly, there's an illusion of choice. But the game's not really asking you, it's telling you. The game gives you just enough choices to feel like you're doing things your way. There's a lot of equipment and upgrade options, and you can choose whether to harvest the little girls or not, and you can outright ignore all of those audio logs that might have given you some important background on Fontaine. Without these possible detours, the game would be rejected like Final Fantasy XIII was for being a big hallway. But in the end, are you any more free in Bioshock? No matter what, you always end up here with Ryan, with a golf club in your hand. Sure, there's tons of games that explore this now, Undertale, Little Inferno, The Stanley Parable, but Bioshock was ahead of its time. And it's a great send-off for Ryan while his plot is hijacked by Fontaine. Ryan knows his guards have failed him. He knows he's not going to be able to fight you off. He's a dead man. But his last act is to mock you by showing you that you're really just a pawn in this whole scheme. This isn't your victory. It's Fontaine's. He's the man, you're the slave. And this isn't even the worst Fontaine has in store for you. No, seriously, have you seen his boss fight? It freaking sucks. Would you kindly? Would you kindly get this? Would you kindly find that? Would you kindly find that? Would you kindly find Would you kindly get this? Would you kindly head to Ryan's office and kill the son of a bitch? Time to settle a score. Our number one betrayal happens to involve one of the entries from our top 10 mysteries. So let's head back to Persona 4. Two people have been murdered, a bunch more were kidnapped, and all of them the day after their image mysteriously appeared on the Midnight Channel. Not to mention the thick fog that envelops the TV world is now hanging over Inaba. Officer Dojima, as well as the party, are baffled, but have done their best to rescue the kidnapped victims from the TV world. This goes on for some time until you finally catch the culprit in the act, the disgraced politician Taro Namatame. After a huge fight where he's possessed by shadows, Namatame is hospitalized and you finally get the chance to end his scheme. The problem is, he's only confessing to the kidnappings, not the murders or the fog. Are we really going to believe this guy? And if that's the case, why is he kidnapping people? If you're too hasty, you might end the game without finding out but give him a chance and you might reach the truth. The victims appearing on the Midnight Channel is actually a false causality. Here's how it works. The Midnight Channel doesn't show future victims. It only shows people who are currently in the public eye. That's why it's always someone who's been on TV recently. Namatame was among the first to find the Midnight Channel. After the first two murders, Namatame falsely concludes that everyone who appears on the channel is a target, so he starts kidnapping victims to quote-unquote, save them. He had the power to cross into the TV world just like Yu Narakami, so he uses his power to throw the victims into the TV world where they would be safe from harm. Namatame had no idea that the TV world was actually a hellish mindscape that would have eventually killed everyone he was trying to protect. Of course Namatame doesn't know any of this because he was being manipulated by the real killer. And man did this catch me off guard! Detective Dojima's partner, Toru Adachi. Man this guy had a good cover. As Dojima's partner he could pretty much go anywhere he wanted and he perfected his bumbling idiot persona. Heh, <laughs> persona. This is a guy who can't do anything right, who hates blood so much that he vomits at the crime scenes. You're telling me that this guy is a serial killer? 
Yes, and one of the best. He's our third character to have TV hopping powers. How he got them is a completely different story. And he's been enjoying a game of cat and mouse, accidentally blurting out classified information to help the party just to see if he can get away with his crimes. His only motive is nihilism. He hates life and wants to have fun however he can. If people turn into shadows in the TV world, he considers that a blessing for them, since at least they won't have to suffer the mortal coil any longer. And though he doesn't really know how the fog works, it seems to be tearing apart reality, and man, f reality. Brilliant, meticulous, sociopathic, ruthless, and the Emmy goes to Adachi. But he doesn't get the number one spot. Oh no, there is another. A co-conspirator. Or at least, there can be. In the re-release Persona 4 Golden, Adachi is expanded upon with the ability for the player to develop a social link with him. His arcana, appropriately, is the Jester. Though even that is a jest, since it actually turns out to be the Hunger. If you continue working on his social link, you eventually get the chance to confront Adachi alone about your suspicions. Or... You can choose to join Adachi in disposing of any evidence that could incriminate him. Why would you do this, you ask? Because you can. In an act of equal nihilism, my top betrayal of all time isn't Adachi. It's you. You the player, you Narakami, and you Atlas for even giving me this choice. Yeah, I did it. I got the accomplice ending, because I wanted to see what happens. And you know what? I feel horrible. Really, really horrible. It's not just one choice. You have to choose to keep quiet to the group, then choose to confront Adachi, then choose to join him, and Adachi even gives you one last chance to not burn the last incriminating letter. And what happens if you do? He laughs at you. He ridicules you. He's not even thankful. He's just impressed that you would betray everyone. Your friends that you've been working with all year to prevent these whores. Dojima who gave you a place to stay. You threw all of that out the window. You piece of human garbage. You want to finish the Jester Arcana? You want to experience 100% of the game? Well, here you go! Inaba is doomed to perilous fog! But you don't care, do you? It's just a game! I said I was picking the betrayals based on narrative satisfaction. That does not mean that something needs to end happily. Most of these entries don't. It means it has to feel right. It needs to feel complete. But here, there is no satisfaction. There's only emptiness. And that, in itself, is kind of satisfying. The party is disappointed. The bad guy is getting away. And he's even threatening you by keeping tabs on you from now on. So the protagonist didn't even benefit from it either. Everything sucks. I didn't just betray my friends. I didn't just betray my family. I betrayed myself. What is wrong with me? I am the Green Scorpion, and I hope you won't betray me by missing our finale to Patreon Month, where I'll be looking at some characters that are oddly important to me. And in all honesty, they really shouldn't be.